Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for attending the event. Um, my name is Wen Gao Ye. I'm a software engineer at Google with five years of, of experience in software development. Today, uh, my topic is how to decide distributed database. We will have a Q&A session in the last 15 minutes. Cool. Um, we will have three sessions. First, I will give you a brief introduction to distributed database. Then we deep dive into the local design framework using Bitable as an example. Finally, we will go through how to involve the design from single machine to multiple machines. Okay. Uh, all right, uh, let's start our journey. So, what is distributed database? A distributed database is a database that runs and stores data across multiple computers as op opposed to doing everything on a single machine. In general, distributed database have several advantages over traditional single instance database. First, um, distributing the database increase resilience and reduce risk. Uh, you can image if a single instance database goes offline uh, due to a power outage, machine failures, schedule maintenance, or anything else, all of the application service that relied on it will go offline too. So distributed database in contrast are typically config with duplicates of the same data across multiple instances. So if one instance goes offline, the other instance can pick up the slack, allowing the application to continue operating. Different distributed database types and configuration handle outage differently, but in general, almost any distributed database should be able to handle outage better than a single instance database. For this reason, distributed databases are an increasingly popular choice, particularly for mission critical workloads and any data that needs to retain available at all times. Second, distributed databases are generally easier to scale. In the context of a growing business, the storage and computing requirements for the database will increase over time and not always at a predictable rate. Trying to keep up with this uh, on a single instance database is difficult. You either have to pay for more than you need so that your database has room to grow in terms of storage and computing power, or you have to navigate regular hardware upgrades and migrations to ensure that the database instance is always running on a machine that's capable of handling the current, current workload. A distributed database, in contrast, can typically be scaled by simply adding an additional instance or load. In some cases, this process is manual, although it can be scripted. And in the case of distributed uh, serverless database, it is entirely automated. In almost all cases, the process of scaling a distributed database up and down is more straightforward than trying to do the same with a single instance database. Uh, third, uh, distributing the database can improve performance. Um, depending on how it is configured, a distributed database may be able to operate more efficiently than a single instance database because it can spread the computing workload between multiple instances rather than being bottlenecked by having to perform all reads and writes on the same machine. Fourth, geographically distributing the database can reduce latency. 
although not all distributed database supports multi-region deployments, those that do can also improve application performance for users by reducing latency. When data can be located on a database instance that is geographically close to the user who is requesting it, that user will likely have a lower latency application experience than the user whose application needs to pull data from a database instance that's, for example, on the other side of the global. Depending on the specific type, configuration and deployment choice. And um, I mean, the uh, company makes, there may be additional benefits to use a distributed database. Now let's look at some of the options that are available when it comes to distributed database. Broadly, there are two types of distributed database, NoSQL and distributed SQL. People usually use document-based and key value to describe NoSQL database. So you may see options compared as document-based versus relational. Before we deep dive, let's do a quick recap of the traditional database, or say relational database. Relational database store data in tables and enforce rules, we call it schema, about what types of data can be stored where and how the data related to each other. The most important feature of relational database is that it supports ACID transactional guarantees. You may ask, what is ACID guarantees for short? It is ensure that transactions are processed correctly and cannot interfere with each other and remain true once they are committed. Even though the even if the database subsequently goes offline. After the explosion of the internet, though it became clear that there were limitations to the traditional relational database. In particular, it was not easy to scale because it wasn't built to function well uh, in cloud environments and distributing it across multiple instances required complex manual work called sharding. Then a new class of database called NoSQL database arose. In part as a response to this, a new class of database called NoSQL database uh, what built to be cloud-native resilient and horizontally scalable. But to accomplish these goals, they sacrifice the strict schema enforcement and ACID guarantees offered by traditional relational database. Storing data in a less structured format. At scale, no SQL database have appealing advantages over traditional relational database, but particularly for trace for tra for tra uh, sorry for tra transactional workloads, they also required uh, making compromise when it comes to data consistencies and correctness. In recent years, a new class of relational database, the distributed SQL database has emerged, aiming for offer a uh, best of both worlds options, providing the cloud native scaling and resilience of NoSQL database in comparison with the strict schema and ACID guarantees of the traditional database. Unlike relational database, distributed SQL database don't require manual work to distribute and scale but they can still offer ACID guarantees, making them a highly appealing prospect for any company with important transactional workloads. 
Today, both NoSQL no and distributed SQL database are widely used, and many organizations use both types. Broadly speaking, NoSQL database are common choice for analytics and big data workloads, while distributed SQL database are used for transactional workloads and other applications such as system of record stores where data consistency cannot be sacrificed for availability for availability and scale. For this reason, a distributed SQL database may sometimes be called a distributed transactional database. Uh, it is worth pointing out that although the terms distributed database and cloud database are sometimes used interchangeably, but they are not necessarily the same thing. A distributed database is any database that's distributed across multiple instances. Often, these instances are deployed to a public cloud provider such as AWS, GCP, or other, but they don't have to be. Distributed database can also be deployed on pre-premise, and some even support hybrid cloud and multiple cloud deployments. A cloud database is any database that is being deployed in the cloud, generally a public cloud, uh, as I stated above. Whether it's a traditional single instance deployment or a distributed deployment. In other words, a distributed database might be run in the cloud, but it doesn't have to. Similarly, a cloud database might be distributed, but it doesn't have to be. All right, um, now let's deep dive into how to design a NoSQL. Before we start, let's compare the file system and database system. File system provides us with a simple interface. We input the file path, then it outputs the file content. Let's say now we have to find the, uh, here is an example. Uh, the input path is slash home slash wonga slash movies uh, dot txt, uh, sorry, here is a typo. Uh, the output is the file content. Uh, you can see that in the file, there are a bunch of rows of uh, movie information. It includes the title of the movie, the director, the rating. Okay, now uh, let's say we want to find the director of the movie inception. How can we do that? First, we open the file and read the content. Second, use a for loop to scan the file content to search for the directory of movie in session. So what are the drawbacks of the file system? As we know, file system provides us with simple read and write operations in practice we usually have more complex query requirements. For example, to query the movies whose director is Christopher Rowland, and query the movies whose rating are between 8.5 and 9.5. So we need a more complex query system built on top of the file system to help us manage such query requirements. Okay, for database system, it is built on top of the file system, responsible for organizing and saving data to the file system and provide user-friendly interface to access and manipulate data. Let's say we have a simple key value database. Now we input the key, uh, use the same movie example. Uh, we input a key in session and author. The database will output the value. 
uh, Christopher Roland to us. Now let's start to think about how we can design a big table like NoSQL. For simplicity, our use case is quite straightforward. We input a key, then the database returns the value to us. First, we need to think about how to store the data. As we know, all data is eventually stored in the file system. So we should think about uh, building a database system based on the file system. How can we better support query operations in a file? Here are two options. Option one, read the file into the memory and then query in it. Uh, I would say it is not very good because the entire file can be very large. A full scan can be time consuming and involve too many IO operations. Option two, we can sort the data by key before it is stored to the disk. Okay, then we can do a binary search on disk to improve the query performance. So uh, we chose the option two because, because option two sounds better than option one. Now we solve the query problem, but if we want to modify the data, how to approach? Again, three options. Um, option one, directly modify the it in the file. I would say it is also not good since it is hard to do so. For example, after the modification, uh, the field size increased from 32 bytes to 64 bytes. Then all the subsequent data needs to be moved, right? So it is not good. Option two, um, read the entire file, modify the E, and then overwrite the original one. I would say it is extreme, extremely time consuming because every time we need to read and write a bunch of unchanged content, the entire file, right? Uh, awesome three, directly append the update operation into the file. Uh, here, append the update op uh, append the update operation into the file means we append a record. Uh, for example, uh, just just some uh, plan test or some we predefine format to inform the system that we are going to update the key uh, blah 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 and with the new value blah 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 something like that. Um, the advantage of this option is that it is very fast because it is just one append operation to the original file, right? However, the drawback is that it makes the file unordered. Uh, let's recall our previous slide. In order to improve the query performance, we sort the file by key to improve the read performance, right? So if we use the direct append operation to support the write operation, this will make our original file unordered. So how to adapt our current solution, the append, the append operation, so that we can perform the bio research when reading and use the append operations while writing. The answer is that we can split the file into chunks and keep each chunk ordered, except the last one when writing. Uh, a quick question. As writing, there will be more and more chunks, which means there will be more and more duplicates. How to solve this problem? Uh, the answer is, is quite straightforward. We can merge the chunks periodically to clean up the duplicates, uh, to, to clean up the duplicates and shrink the file size. Uh, note, in practice, we use SS table. Uh, SS table is 
sort for sorted string tables uh, to implement the order the, the, to implement the ordered chunk. SS table is a widely used file format. Uh, you can simply consider it as an immutable file of key value string pairs sorted by keys. Now we still have one question, um, how to convert the last unordered chunk into an ordered SS table. We have two options here. Option one, read the chunk into memory, do a quick sort, and then flush out. Do we really need this since it means for each data record, we need to write it to the disk. Then we read the entire chunk into memory, perform a quick sort, and then flush out back to the disk. This whole process is, is extremely inefficient. So here's the option two. We can keep the data in memory at the very beginning and sync it to the disk when the chunk size reaches to the limited. This option sounds much better than the and, and more reasonable than the previous one, right? Uh, for option two, we still have a small questions. The memory data will lost if there is a power outage or the machine fail, right? So here we can use the write ahead lock, uh, WAL for sort. For each write operations, we write the, the, the write ahead lock first and then update the memory data. Some people may wonder in this solution, here we need to write, the, write to the disk again, right? It seems we get back to the previous dilemma. We, we write the disk, uh, which is not so efficient, right? So uh, just rest, write ahead lock is very convenient and efficient. It is uh, defined for the uh, for efficient write and manipulate with the disk. So uh, at this point, let's do a quick recap of the write operation we have go through so far. Firstly, the client sends a write request to the machine. Here we still in a single machine, uh, uh, in a single machine, con in, a, in a single machine situations. So, firstly, the client sends a write request to the machine. Uh, secondly, the machine commits to the write ahead log. Thirdly, the machine inserts the key value pair to the skip list in the memory. Uh, in the me memory, uh, we use skip list to uh, store the key value pair, which which can uh, provide efficient insert, update, and delete operations. Finally, when the skip list reaches to its capacity. The machine serialized the skip list to the disk as an SS table. All right, with the current settings, how can we perform the read operations? First, we search the key from the skip list in the memory. If the skip list contains the key, then we return the value. This operation is very fast because the time complexity of searching from a skip list is O log n, and the operation happens in the memory. If we cannot find the key from the in-memory skip list, then we need to search the key from each SS table. Quick questions here. How to improve the performance of searching from SS table? Of course, we can use the binary search on disk to improve the query performance, but it is not 
good enough. Besides the binary search on disk, we can build memory index for SS table. Put simply, for each SS table, we put some keys and their corresponding address in the memory as index. Then, before we do a binary search on the SS table, we do a binary search on the index in memory, in memory first to narrow down the key range so that we can effectively reduce the number of disk widths. However, we may still need to search on every SS table to find a key. Even though we have memory index and binary search on disk techniques to help us to improve the performance, it can still be our bottleneck. Is there an efficient method to help us determine whether a key is in the SS table? The answer is that we can use Bloom filter. Uh, some people may ask, what is a Bloom filter? So I will give you a short introduction to Bloom filter. A Bloom filter is a probabilistic data structure that is based on hashing. It is extremely space efficient and is typically used to add elements to a set and test if an element is in the set. Though the elements themselves are not added to a set, Instead, multiple hash values of the elements are added to the set. When testing if an element is in the Bloom filter, false positives are possible. It will either say that an element is definitely not in the set, or that it is possible the element is in the set. Uh, it sounds a bit confusing, right? So uh, for simplicity, you can remember that if the Bloom filter said the element, it is not present, that means the element is 100% not present here. But if the Bloom filter said the element is in the set, it means the element may possibly in the set. Okay, so uh, I would say false is always false, but true is not always true. Okay, now uh, back to our case. Uh, we'll, we will build a Bloom filter for each SS table and keep all Bloom filters in the memory. As we stated, Bloom filter is fixed size, so it is controllable how many memory we are going to use. It will not expand as the number of elements. The Bloom filter will not expand as the number of elements in the set increase. So we can store all, all Bloom filters in the memory. Now for the read operations. Before we actually check, I mean, binary search uh, in an SS table, we check the Bloom filter first. If the Bloom filter doesn't contain the key, then we can simply skip the corresponding SS table. This can save us a lot of time. All right, uh, now let's put all of them together to get a full process of the re-operation. First, we check the memory skip list. If we can find the key, then we directly return the result. Otherwise, we go to next step. Then uh, the next step, we check the Bloom filter one by one. If we can find the key, we will go to the next step. Otherwise, we check next Bloom filter. If we cannot find the key in all Bloom filters, that means the key doesn't exist in the database. Okay, let's say we uh, now let's say the Bloom filter uh, tells us that a key is it, 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 uh, a key is present. Now, before we check the actual SS table, we perform a binary search 
on the index to narrow down the key range. Then we use the the key the the narrow down key range to do a further bio research on the SS table. You can see that uh, we have made a lot of efforts to improve the reoperation performance because we use a simple a simple strategy for write operation, which is uh, which is the append operations. Okay, cool. Uh, now we have talked about uh, how to uh, decide the base operation, read operation, and write operation uh, for a big table in a single machine. Now we. Can it's time for us to involve it to a distributed one? Um, before we uh before we deep dive, uh, I we will I will talk about uh how we can sharding the data uh across multiple machines. Uh, basically, we will use horizontal sharding to distribute the table the table across multiple machines. Under the hook, horizontal sharding use consistent hashing based on the key to dispatch the rows to different machines. And we will use a coordinator server which contains the consistent hash map to manage multiple data servers. This is a typical coordinator and workers design pattern. Okay, now um, let's take a look at how to read a key uh, in our current settings. Step one, the client sends the read request to the coordinator with the low key. Uh, let's say uh, the movie I want, I want, I want to. Uh, step two, the coordinator performs the consistent hashing on the low key to get the data server address then returns the information back to the client step three the client sends the read request to the corresponding data server with the low key and the column key step four the data server performs the actual query as we stated in the previous slides and then returns the value back to the client now let's do a quick recap again on the process of the data server. In the data server, first, we check the in-memory skip list. If we can find the key, then we directly return the result. Otherwise, we go to check the Bloom filter one by one. If we can find the key in the Bloom filter, we go to next step. Otherwise, we check next Bloom filter. If we cannot find the key in all Bloom filters, that means the key doesn't exist in the database. Now, before we check the actual SS table, we perform a binary search on the index to narrow down the key range. Finally, we do a binary search on the SS table with the narrowed key range to find the value. OK, now let's take a look at how to write a key Step one, the client sends the right request to the coordinator server, again, with the low key. Step two, the coordinator performs the consistent hashing on the low key to get the data server address and then returns the information to the client. Step three, the client sends the right request to the corresponding data server with the low key, the column key, and the new value, the updated value. Step four, the data server performs the actual write as we stated at the previous slides, and then returns the ACK signal back to the client. Now let's do a quick recap again on the process of the data server. First, we commit to the write ahead log. Then we update the memory skip list if the skip list reaches to its capacity, then we serialize it 
as an SS table to the disk. Here are some frequently asked questions. Question one, now we use horizontal sharding to distribute the data loads to multiple data servers. How to avoid single point failure? Instead, use, instead of using replicas, uh, it doesn't necessary to store the actual data in the local disk. We can store the data to the DFS, which will take care of the replicas for us. That means the data, the data server itself doesn't store the actual data. All the data are delegated to the DFS. Question two, if there is a read request during we are writing the same key, then the race condition happens. How to solve it? Put simply, we can use a lock, a distributed lock. Since the distributed locks stores the key information and metadata, so we don't need a separate coordinator server anymore. Uh, the distributed lock system itself can act as the coordinator for us. So now uh, let's take a look at how to write a key with the distributed locks. As we stated, we don't need to have a separate coordinator server now because we use the distributed lock. Here, the distributed lock itself is also a distributed system. For example, we can implement a distributed lock with the zookeeper, the Apache zookeeper. Uh, so, uh, but this topic is out of our today's topic. So I will, I will not uh, deep dive into it you can consider the distributed lock itself uh, as something like a coordinator server or, or some, yeah, you know, uh, the coordinator server or just a simple distributed system can take care of all the uh, metadata query and related and consistent hashing mapping storage stuff for you. Okay. Uh, Yes, uh, let's get back to our topic. Uh, step one, uh, the client. Uh, step one, again, the client sends the write and lock key request to the distributed lock. Step two, the, the, the distributed lock locks the key and returns the data server address to the client. Step three, the client sends the write request to the corresponding data server with the row key, the column key, and the updated value. Step four, the data server commits the write ahead lock to its local disk. Step five, the data server writes the key value pair to its memory, to its in-memory skip list. Step six, the data server flush the write ahead lock from its local disk to the DFS and serialize the skip list as an SS table to the DFS. Step seven, the data server sends the ACK signal back to the client. Step eight, the client sends the unlock key request to the distributed lock server. Okay, uh, again, now let's take a look at how to read a key with the lock, with the distributed lock. Step one, the client sends the read and lock key request to the distributed lock system. Step two, the lock system locks the key and returns the data server address to the client. Step three, the client sends the read request to the corresponding data server with the row key and the column key. Step four, the data server checks its memory. More specifically, it checks the skip list, the Bloom filter, and the index for each SS table. Step five, if the data server cannot find the key from its memory, 
then it does a binary search on SS table from the DFS to find the value. Step six, the data server sends the corresponding value back to the client. Step seven, the client sends the unlock key request to the distributed lock server. All right, a uh, long journey. Thank you all for listening. Uh, designing a distributed database system is a very complicated process. It involves a lot of engineering considerations at different aspects. Today's our 30 minutes talk just goes through the surface of the system and only focus on a very small portion, uh, just a tip of the iceberg. Any questions are welcome. Uh, cool, uh, no questions. Thank you all for joining the event today. Uh, hope the talk was helpful to all of you. Please feel free to continue the discussion with me on the event page. See you, take care.